Are Ouija boards evil? That is a question that has plagued the parlor game for centuries. As its true origin is still unknown, its legacy is something that is steeped in mystery and apprehension. Ouija boards in their basic form were around long before it was patented and marketed towards kids and families curious about the prospect of communicating with the unknown. Of course, before long, stories of hauntings, violence and even possession followed, giving it the reputation of being an instrument of evil. I'm Bleaky, and today I will tell you about the history of the Ouija board and one of the worst entities ever conjured by the alphabetic conduit that destroyed the lives of those involved and was the basis for the iconic horror movie The Exorcist and gave birth to popular horror tropes. But how did the tool, which claimed to be the supernatural equivalent to a DM slide, first get discovered and how true are the terrifying tales that surround the spirit board? Was the Ouija board nothing more than a macabre marketing idea? Or did the novelty toy company irresponsibly thrust it into public popularity and revive a powerful tool that should never have become mainstream? The Ouija board is generally known as a tool that can pierce the veil between the realms of the living and the dead. Some believe that the board can simply allow people to speak with the deceased loved ones, while others claim that it could be used by demonic or non-human entities to infest the lives of those opening themselves up while using the simple device. The Ouija board stems from spiritualism and the belief that the dead can communicate with the living. This idea has existed for thousands of years, but became more prominent in the US during the 19th century when war, disease, poverty, dangerous labour and childbirth complications decreased life expectancy. Those who lost loved ones were desperate to speak with them once again, and so the concept of mediumship and contacting the dead became socially acceptable and even wholesome in some circles. Fun for all the family, even those that are six feet under. This interest led to the invention of the precursor to the Ouija board, the talking board, in the 1880s. It is unknown who actually came up with the original concept, but it was a businessman called Charles Kennard, who reportedly had no interest in spiritualism, who brought it to the mainstream. Kennard reportedly teamed up with a coffin maker called E.C. Reich, who he then cut out the deal once the Ouija board had been developed. It wasn't smooth sailing for Kennard, however, who failed to secure funding until an attorney called Elijah Bond joined the venture. The two formed the Kennard Novelty Company in 1890 and began producing the spirit boards. It is claimed that the name came from the ancient Egyptian phrase, good luck, although Bond's sister-in-law, Helen Peters, who was also a medium, did have a lot of involvement in the design of the board. She later said that she used to wear a locket with a picture on it, which also had a word that looked like Ouija written on it. It seems that Helen may have needed a trip to Specsavers, however, as it is believed she misread the writing. This could actually be the case, as at the time there was an author and activist called Queda. Initially, the patent officer refused to accept the Ouija board, until Helen Peters did a demonstration right there in the office, which spelled out the officer's real and unknown name. Regardless if this is true, the patent officer changed his mind and the Ouija board patent was issued on February 10th, 1891. The company was a hit, and eventually an employee called William Fold took over the company. Strangely, later in 1927, Fold fell off the roof of a new factory. Chillingly, before his demise, Fold said that he was told to build that specific factory for a spirit board session. Was something setting up the circumstances that would lead to Fold's fate? The Ouija, the wonderful talking game, became a cultural staple when it hit shelves in 1891. After that, family and friends would join together and ask questions to their loved ones and watch the planchette move and reply back to them. 
It was regarded as fun, exciting, and at its core, a paranormal communication tool that only had good intentions. But all that was about to change. In 1930, a woman called Clothhild Marchand was found at the bottom of the stairs, unalive. It turned out that a woman called Leela Jimerson was having an affair with Clothhild's husband and arranged a Ouija board session with Nancy Bowen, a Seneca tribal healer, where both women claimed to have spoken to Nancy Bowen's deceased husband. During the session, Nancy's husband said, they killed me, to which Nancy asked, who did? The board spelled out an answer, letter by letter. Clothhild. After that, Bowen received mysterious letters saying Clothhild was a white witch and had hexed her husband. Enraged, she went to Marchand's house, better with a hammer, before stuffing a chloroform rag down her throat. During the trial, Bowen explained what her deceased husband had shared through the Ouija board. Most assumed that Jimerson had tricked Bowen by pushing the planchette to give the answer that would make her seek revenge so that she could have Mr. Merchant all to herself, but Jimerson swore that she played no part in the crime and that the Ouija board session was genuine. While an evil spirit using a Ouija board wasn't directly to blame in that case, the tragic story of a young boy in the late 1940s completely changed the perception of the device and marked it as an irresponsible and life-destroying activity. In the United States, priests of the Roman Catholic Church performed a series of exorcisms on a then anonymous boy who was given the synonym Roland Doe or Robbie Mannheim, but later it was revealed that he was Ronald Hunkler. The 14-year-old boy was born to a family living in Maryland. Ronald was an only child and depended on the adults in his house to be his playmates. In particular, Ronald spent a lot of time with his Aunt Harriet, who was a spiritualist who introduced the boy to the Ouija board. Sadly, Aunt Harriet passed away. Shortly after, the family experienced strange noises, furniture moving around the house on its own, and household items began levitating when the boy was around. To Ronald, his most favourite person in the world was trying to show him she was still around. Little did he know that even the dead can wear masks. The activity began to ramp up, and the family feared for their safety. They eventually turned to a Lutheran pastor, Luther Miles Schultz, and asked him for help. The pastor asked if the boy could spend a night in his home in order to observe the activity. Unbelievably, he watched household items and furniture move around his home by themselves. Things ramped up even further with the bed shaking when Ronald was in it, as well as a picture of Christ shaking violently on the wall. Signs of a poltergeist. Or worse. Once the sun rose and the troubling activity calmed down, he returned the boy and told the parents that they should see a Catholic priest, believing that the boy had inadvertently invited a demonic or inhuman spirit for the Ouija board, who disguised itself as his deceased aunt. Of course, the boy was mourning her death and missed her. In this vulnerable state, the entity knew that he would open himself up, an invite it graciously accepted. After getting permission from the Archbishop, Ronald was subjected to several exorcisms, including one performed by William Bowdern and Edward Hughes, who conducted more than 20 rituals on the boy in the span of three months. Writing in his diary on the 10th of March 1949, Bowdern noted how Ronald entered a trance-like state which was witnessed by 14 people. It was during this series of exorcisms that the demonic spirit took full possession, maybe fearing that the attention of the religious figures could mean the party was over. In his diary, Bowden wrote, Scratching, which bet out a rhythm of marching soldiers. Second-class relic of St. Margaret Mary was thrown on the floor. The safety pin was open, but no human hand had touched the relic. R started up in fright when the relic was thrown down. It is said that Ronald managed to slip one of his hands out of the tight restraints, and also managed to break coiled bed springs from under a mattress. Things took a sinister turn when the boy managed to grab hold of a sharp object and began slashing at the arm of one of the priests. This forced the exorcism ritual to be called off on that occasion, the outcome the dark entity was hoping for. Ronald was relocated to St. Louis to be treated for demonic possession, a decision that the spirit was in favour for as it began scratching words into the boy's skin. On one evening, the word Louis was carved into the boy's ribs, while the word Saturday appeared in a deep red scratch on his hip. 
As to the length of time the mother and boy should stay in St. Louis, another message was printed on the boy's chest, three and a half weeks. Kind of sounds like a supernatural booking confirmation. It's a good job it didn't give the return information to, or else he would have been left looking like a scrabble board. What makes this quite interesting is that people went on record to say that the words appeared without any motion from the boy or those around him. In fact, the words hell and evil were allegedly scribed in his skin by an unseen hand. Ronald was admitted to the Alexian Brothers Hospital on the 21st of March 1949. A month into his stay, during an exorcism, Hunkler broke into a violent tantrum of screaming, swearing and yelling in Latin phrases. The bed violently shook and the boy's cries began to sound less and less human, like a growl that only a wild creature could make before the Catholic priests claimed that they had cast the demon out of his body. In an article published in the Washington Post on August 20th, 1949, reporter Bill Brinkley declared that the boy had been freed by a Catholic priest of possession by the devil. We just don't get paranormal articles like this anymore. Instead, we get things like this. Yep, an obvious sign of fang shaming right there. The story of Ronald became the inspiration for the iconic horror movie, The Exorcist, which went on to inspire several demonic possession themed movies, as well as cement the public perception that Ouija boards are a gateway to demons and evil spirits looking to return to the land of the living. Ronald went on to have a pretty ordinary life, and in adult life he went on to become a NASA engineer who worked on the Apollo space missions of the 60s. He even patented one of his inventions that helped space shuttle panels withstand extreme heat. Now that's pretty impressive. Hunkler eventually retired from NASA in 2001 after working for the agency for just under 40 years. A friend of Ronald told the New York Post that he was always scared that his NASA colleagues would find out about his past and that he was the inspiration for the Exorcist movie. I mean, can you blame him? Finding tins of pea soup on your desk every morning would suck. She also said that on Halloween, he always left the house because he was worried that someone would come to his home and hound him about his terrifying demonic experiences. While the demon was cast out, the stigma and torment never left him. Sadly, the friend also said that he had a terrible life due to the constant worry he suffered. Not exactly the mind frame of somebody who faked the whole thing for attention. I think it's fair to add that many people have claimed that the boy faked the possession, including a psychiatrist who said the boy had a mental illness. Friends and neighbours also shared that Ronald was a little trickster in his youth, who had pulled off pranks to frighten his mother and fool the other children in the neighbourhood. But if that was the case, how did words appear on his skin and how did furniture move on its own? The fear Ouija boards have instilled in society is still as prevalent today as it was decades ago. Mainstream Christian and Catholic groups have warned against the use of Ouija boards considering their use in satanic worship, while other religious groups claim that they can lead to demonic possession, just like the case of Ronald Hunkler. Occultists, however, are divided on the topic, with some claiming it can be used as a tool to communicate with spirits that are not evil, as long as they are used by experienced people who know how to stay safe while contacting the dead. So, do you think Ouija boards are evil? Or do you think they are nothing more than a novelty game that gained a sinister reputation? Let me know what you think in the comments section below. I would love to hear if any of you have ever used a Ouija board and what experiences you might have had, whether they were good or bad. If you ever find yourself using a Ouija board for the first time, just make sure to follow the rules to keep yourself safe and be wary about who you might be in contact with. They may say that they are a loved one, but they may just be telling you what you want to hear so that they can become your new roomie. And like in the case of Ronald and other cases of possession, an eviction notice just won't cut it when they get too rowdy. If you enjoyed this video and would like to watch more just like it, make sure to hit the subscribe button and ring the notification bell. According to the analytics, only 15.2 of you guys who watch me have subscribed, which means that you won't get notified when I upload new videos. Subscribing really helps my channel grow and allows me to make more frequent uploads, so please consider joining the Bleaky team. And as always, sleep well, friends. Would you eat your ball? Would you eat your ball?